Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's ADL webinar for law enforcement. We will get started shortly. Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's ADL webinar for law enforcement. We'll get started in just another minute. We're allowing a little time for the session to populate. Well, good morning or afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from, and thank you for joining us. We hope each of you are well and staying healthy and safe. Please note that today's session will be recorded. In order to maintain focus on our speakers, all participants' mics and videos have been turned off. I'm Elise Jarvis, Director of Law Enforcement Outreach and Partnerships for the ADL or Anti-Defamation League, and I would like to welcome you to today's law enforcement webinar on understanding and combating hate crimes. As you may know, ADL has been a longstanding leader in the fight against hate crimes. ADL crafted the first model hate crime legislation in the country, and 46 states plus the District of Columbia now have laws based on or similar to ADL's model. ADL also led a large coalition of organizations that ultimately spearheaded the passage of the Ma landmark Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crime Prevention Act in, 2009, in 2009, <clears throat> which was the most important, comprehensive, and inclusive federal hate crime law passed in more than 50 years. During today's webinar, we will hear personal remarks on the impact of hate crimes from Houston police officer, Jamie Bird Grant, whose father, James Bird Jr., was murdered by white supremacists in 1998 and in whose memory the 2009 federal legislation was named. Officer Bird Grant was 16 years old at the time of her father's death. After her remarks, ADL will provide a briefing highlighting key takeaways from the recently released 2020 FBI hate crimes data and provide examples of best practices when it comes to hate crime prevention and response. We will then allow some time for questions. Questions may be asked via the chat function in Zoom and may be entered at any time. For additional ADL resources on combating hate crimes, you may refer to our website at adl.org and to connect with ADL after this webinar, including to request information about our interactive hate crime workshops for law enforcement, you can either contact me at ejarvis at adl.org that's E-J-A-R-V-I-S at ADL.org. Or you can contact your local ADL regional office, which can be located at ADL.org forward slash regions. I would also be happy to connect you with your local ADL regional office. I now have the honor of introducing our special guest, Officer Jamie Bird Grant. Officer Bird Grant is a 10-year veteran with the Houston Police Department. She's currently working in the Office of Community Affairs as the Houston Citizens Police Academy Alumni Association Coordinator as well as the March on Crime Coordinator. Over the years, Officer Bird Grant has served as an advocate against racial injustice. She was a driving force in lobbying in support of the James Bird Jr. Hate Crimes Act in Texas and the Matthew Shepard and James Bird Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act at the federal level. She has a bachelor's degree in administration of justice from Texas Southern University and a master's degree in human science from Prairie View A&M University. She is the founder of the James Bird Jr. Foundation for Kids Nonprofit and author of the upcoming book, Triumph Over Tragedy. We are also very proud to have her serving as a regional board member for ADL Southwest Regional Office. ADL has been honored to partner with the Bird family in fighting hate for more than 20 years. We have asked Officer Bird Grant to join us today to share a few words about her personal experiences and the impact of hate crimes. Officer Bird Grant, welcome. The session is yours. Hello. Thank you, everyone, for having me. Again, my name is Jamie Bird Grant, and I am the youngest daughter of James Bird Jr., the Black man that was brutally dragged behind a pickup truck in Jasper, Texas, on June 7, 1998. On June 7, my life and my family's life changed forever. I was faced with the decision to hate the entire Caucasian race, 
or to hate the individuals who killed my dad on that summer night. But as I grew older, I became wiser and I did not hate the entire Caucasian race because that's not how I was raised. But I did have a great amount of hate in my heart for those three individuals who um, sought out a black man on that night. And that man happened to be my dad. I had to find it in my heart sometime to forgive. Um, and it was very hard. I'm 39 years old. And over my lifetime, I battled with forgiving. I battled with, um, I knew that that was something that I was raised um, with. I was raised in a church and I was raised to forgive those um, for myself and not so much for them. So over the years, I did forgive them because I knew that if I wanted to live a life of abundance, and the life of prosperity and to be the change that I wanted to see, I could not no longer have that hate in my heart. So I began to process my feelings and my hate and I channeled that to towards forgiving. And as an early age, 16 years old, I began to, I was very instrumental, myself and my family was very instrumental in passing the hate crime bill, the Jamesburg Junior Hate Crime, and also the Matthew Shepard and Jamesburg Prevention Act. So as a young kid, I knew that there was work to be done in this country to combat hate. And so that's exactly what I did. I wanted to be the change that I wanted to see in others, which is to spread love and not hate. So I joined the Houston Police Department because I wanted to be that young, especially a black female and change the perception of not just police officers, but the skewed perception on black and black officers in as, as a whole, as joining the police force. In a predominantly black neighborhood, we're looked upon, the police officers are looked upon as um, we're out to get you. And so I wanted to change that perception within the police force as a whole. So that's why I joined the police force and I wanted to be that change. Today, I work in the Office of Community Affairs where I do numerous of work in the streets of Fifth Ward um, area where I go into the communities and I talk to young kids um, about not just racial discrimination, but also um, hate against um, gender. And uh, we have a lot of that going on here in Houston as well as um, racial discrimination discrimination as well. So I wanted to just spread the spread the love of hate, uh, spread the spread the word of love and not hate, excuse me. And and another reason I joined the ADL board because I wanted to be a part of something that was um, a driving force not just for Houston but just for our country. We we um, have to spread it. Uh, a worldwide that hate is no way to be. And so that's why I um, became a police officer. Thank you. Thank you, Officer Bird Grant. Um, you're gonna be willing to um, stay on for a few minutes of Q&A towards the end, Excellent. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. I understand you have to teach after this. Um, so if you have to leave a few minutes early, we we under, we all understand. Um, but to the extent you're able to stay on, then that's wonderful. Um, I want to take a, just a minute to thank you for your meaningful remarks on, and, um, and, and window into the impact of these crimes. Mm -hmm. um, your, your story really shows the, the effects that, or it's a reminder that of the effects that hate crimes have not only on victims, but their families and targeted communities. And uh, I'll just say how truly inspiring it is to know you, to know how you and your family uh, engage in such critical advocacy in the wake of such an unspeakable tragedy. Um, thank you for joining us today and the work that you continue to do. Thank you. I'm gonna uh, now uh, introduce my colleague, Amy Feynman. Uh, Amy will provide a briefing highlighting some of the key takeaways from the recently released 2020 hate crimes data and provide examples of best practices when it comes to hate crime prevention and response. Amy serves as ADL's Northeast Area Civil Rights Council. In that capacity, she oversees ADL civil rights work in 13 states and advises five of ADL's regional offices on core civil rights equities, including countering anti-Semitism and hate, fighting bigotry and discrimination, safeguarding religious freedom, and the separation of church and state, 
and promoting immigrant and refugee rights. Prior to ADL, Amy worked as a litigation associate at the law firm Latham and Wacom's LLP. Amy is a graduate of the University of Michigan uh, and a 2012 graduate of the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Amy? Thanks so much, Elise. Just bear with me a moment as I share my screen. Okay, thank you so much, Elise, and thank you, Officer Bird Grant, for your powerful remarks, for your continued advocacy when it comes to hate crime laws, and for your service to the community. Um, my name is Amy Feynman. I serve as the Northeast Area Civil Rights Council at ADL. Want to provide a brief overview of the 2020 hate crime statistics that were recently released share some information regarding um, best practices when it comes to hate crime response from ADL's perspective, and then of course leave some time for Q&A at the very end. The first thing I want to mention is that in addition to playing a lead role in developing hate crime statutes across the country, we also serve as a key resource to constituents who believe that they may have been targeted um, by someone in connection with a hate crime. So we work very closely with law enforcement in connection with our incident response and do hope that you will take Elise up on her offer to be connected to our regional offices if you aren't already, um, you know, work very closely with law enforcement in connection with that work. The first thing that I'd like to mention is that it's very important to remember and recognize that hate crimes date all the way back to our nation's founding. I've included a few images here, including the image, for example, of Emmett Till, a 14-year-old child who was savagely murdered after being accused of offending a white woman. You may recognize here also the mother of Vincent Chin holding a photo of her son who was murdered in 1982 two white men who blamed him for the Japanese quote-unquote taking of their auto industry jobs. Finally included an image of Balbir Singh Sodhi, a sick man who was mistakenly believed to be Muslim and murdered by a person who was supposedly seeking retribution for the 9-11 attacks. And so hate crimes really have been with us since our nation's founding. Um, also important to remember that when it comes to the national consciousness of hate crimes, our country really didn't recognize hate crimes as a distinct form of harm until the 1980s, including in connection with two very high profile hate crimes. It was also not until the early 1980s that states began to pass hate crime laws with Oregon and Washington to be the first in the early 1980s. Uh, 1981 was again the first year that ADL published its model hate crime statute. It wasn't until the late 1990s with the horrifying murders of Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. that we really saw um, concerted federal action when it comes to strengthening and improving hate crime laws at the federal level. This shot slide shows just a snapshot of key federal statutes when it comes to hate crimes. The first being the Hate Crime Statistics Act. So it wasn't until 1990 that this act was passed essentially requires the attorney general to collect and report out data on hate crimes. While data collection, of course, remains voluntary, this was a really important milestone in terms of being able to understand the nature and magnitude of hate field crime in the U.S. We'll come back to this theme momentarily. 1993 was the year in which the U.S. Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of hate crime statutes in a case called Wisconsin v. Mitchell. Um, very important uh, U.S. Supreme Court case when it comes to hate crime laws. We, of course, saw the Church Arson Prevention Act and the Shepherd Bird Act in first in 1996, then in 2009 as two landmark bills that expanded the scope of federal hate crime laws. And then just this year, in the wake of COVID-19, we saw the passage of the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act, which improves local and state hate crime training, prevention, best practices, and data collection initiatives, and also provides grants for State hate crime reporting hotlines. So I want to take a moment and do a quick pop quiz regarding hate crimes. If you're brave, you should feel free to type your answers in the chat. Otherwise, just hang tight and think through what your answers might be. Um, first question is, how many states have laws criminalizing bias-motivated violence or intimidation? I see some answers, which is great. Okay. So I'm seeing 
oh, you know what? A fairly even representation. So I'm seeing a lot of A's, B's, and C's. Most people actually guess A, and it's, it's some of these are somewhat of a trick question, right? So they're intended to, um, you know, make you think twice. But the correct answer to this question is actually C, 46 states. So the 24s, though, people who answer 24, you're not necessarily wrong because most states in our country do not have what we would deem to be comprehensive and inclusive hate crime statutes. So while 46 states do have hate crime laws on the books, the vast majority of the laws in those states are not comprehensive and inclusive. So from ADL's perspective, we only consider the dark blue states to have comprehensive and inclusive hate crime laws meaning that all protected characteristics are, are covered, including, for example, sexual orientation, gender identity, and disability. There are only, though, four states still that have no hate crime laws on the books at all, Arkansas, Indiana, South Carolina, and Wyoming. And so we know that at their core, hate crimes are message crimes. They have an incredibly deep impact, not only on the individual victim, but also on the community at large. That's really why from ADL's perspective, we think it's so important to ensure that all states across the country have comprehensive and inclusive hate crime statutes. So back to our pop quiz. According to the data reported to the FBI in 2020, which category had the largest number of bias crimes? Okay, I'm seeing answers come in. This is great. And I'm seeing a lot of A's. So that is the correct answer. So racial bias in 2020 accounted for about 63.7% of all reported hate crimes. Um, and as is the case every year since 1991, race-based hate crimes were the most numerous. So we saw 4,939 of the total 7,759 hate crimes, about 64%. Um, constituted race-based hate crimes. And the number that we saw in 2020 was the highest number of race-based hate crimes reported since 2006, was also a 25% increase over the number of race-based hate crimes in 2019. So we saw not only did racial bias account for a significant proportion of overall hate crimes, also we saw a real spike in um, race-based hate crimes last year. You can see here that anti-Black, or as the FBI calls it, anti-African-American hate crimes were by far the most numerous um, of race-based hate crimes in 2020. Anti-Latinx and anti-Asian hate crimes followed. This is really consistent with data that we've seen over the years. So it has always been the case that anti-Black hate crimes constitute a plurality of all race-based hate crime offenses in our country. Next question, um, hate crimes motivated by religious bias accounted for 15.1% of all reported hate crimes in 2020. Which religion was targeted the most? Great, lots of answers coming in and lots of A's and B's. Um, those tend to be the most popular answers when this question is posed. Correct answer is B. So in 2020, anti-Jewish bias accounted for about 57.6% of all single motive hate crimes motivated by religious bias in 2020. This category overall, so religion-based hate crimes was the second most numerous category of hate crimes followed by race-based hate crimes. We saw a total of 1,174 religion-based hate crimes last year. Important to note that this was a 23% decrease relative to the figures that we saw in 2019. But we did see that crimes directed against Jews and Jewish institutions were the most numerous. So there were 676 total anti-Jewish hate crimes reported. At the same time, just as the religion-based category decreased, so did the anti-Jewish hate crime category. So we saw a 29% decrease last year from 953 crimes um, reported in 2019 to the numbers that we saw in 2020. Um, so you can see here the disparities between the anti-Jewish hate crimes reported in 2020 and data targeting other religious groups, but it's incredibly important to take this data with a grain of salt. So the data, of course, is only as good as, as is being reported by members of the community, and then, of course, also by law enforcement up to the, ABA, uh, the FBI. ADL has serious concerns regarding barriers that exist that prevent members of other religious communities from coming forward to report crimes in the first instance. And some of those barriers don't apply to many within the Jewish community. So really important to recognize, for example, 
you know, real concerns that we have regarding underreporting of individuals who may be targeted in anti-Muslim hate crimes, for example. So here you can see, though, over the years, consistently see that anti-Jewish hate crimes in the religion-based category always represent the plurality of religion-based hate crimes reported out to the FBI. Again, really important to take it with a grain of salt. So here is a slide that summarizes the overall data that we saw in 2020. So we saw, as I mentioned, a total of 7,759 hate crimes. There were 22 hate crime murders in that group. This figure was a 6% increase relative to 2019, but it's also the highest number of hate crimes that we've seen since 2008, which is pretty significant you know, in the context of a global pandemic in particular. Um, reported hate crimes targeting Black people rose 43%, extremely concerning to ADL. Same with reported anti-AAPI hate crimes. We saw a 61% increase. We also saw after an 18% increase in 2019, another 19% increase in gender identity-based hate crimes, crimes targeting people who are non-binary or transgender. And then when it comes to anti-Hispanic or anti-Latinx hate crimes, we saw the numbers decrease slightly in 2020, but this was still a record high number that was reported. It was the second highest number since 2010. So this slide will show you just in a graph form the fact that the numbers that we saw in 2020 were extremely high, the, again, the highest number that we've seen since 2008, if notwithstanding the global pandemic. Here you can see really how distinct and sharp that 43% increase is when it comes to anti-Black hate crimes. Again, we have real concerns about underreporting of anti-Black hate crimes, so it could be the case that these numbers are even more stark um, and the increase is more dramatic. Anti-AAPI hate crimes, um, crimes uh, targeting the Asian and Pacific Islander community also rose, again, 61%. We know that much of the um, animus and hate directed towards the AAPI community, unfortunately tied to the COVID-19 pandemic. So while not surprising, these numbers are really telling. And I, again, from our perspective, believe that this may actually be an under-reporting and under-representation of what's actually taking place on the ground. Um, here you can see the anti-Latinx hate crimes. As I mentioned, slight decrease in 2020, but still really record high numbers that we are seeing relative to other years. Next few slides show categories where reported hate crimes decreased. Again, important to consider under-reporting concerns and also the ways in which the pandemic may have affected these figures. But we did see a decline in the number of reported anti-Indigenous hate crimes. Again, a decrease in the number of anti-Jewish hate crimes last year, and then a consistent decline in the number of reported anti-Muslim hate crimes, but go back to my grain of salt note um, when it comes to um, potential fears within the community coming forward to report anti-Muslim hate crimes. Um, crimes based on sexual orientation have remained markedly high over the years and consistently high. You know, according to survey data, people who are gay, lesbian, bisexual only represent about 3.5% of the population. So these statistics are consistently disproportionately high and very concerning. Same with hate crimes based on gender identity bias. So, you know, in contrast to the sexual orientation bias figures, which have remained relatively consistent, these numbers are much smaller, but they are steadily increasing. So again, you can see steady increases from 2017 on when it comes to gender identity-based hate crimes, really important to um, be addressing and responding to these crimes accordingly. And then the final category is hate crimes based on disability bias. You can again see a decrease in 2020, but you know, keep in mind concerns regarding underreporting and the ways in which the pandemic may have affected um, you know, these numbers on the ground. So I um, want to talk for a moment about law enforcement reporting of hate crimes. So we saw in 2020 reports come in from 15,136 law enforcement agencies. Unfortunately, this was a 3% decline relative to 2019, and it's also the third straight year of decline in police participation in the Hate Crime Statistics Act program. We really want to work in the next year to get those numbers up. 
We also saw, and this is relatively consistent um, when you look back over the years, there were only about 2,267 um, agencies that reported one or more hate crimes to the FBI in 2020. That's a, a slightly less than 15% of all who participated reported one or more, which essentially means that every other agency, 85%, affirmatively reported zero hate crimes to the FBI. And we saw at least 60 jurisdictions with populations over 100,000 also reported zero hate crimes. And then finally, we, we identified at least 10 cities with populations over 100,000 that didn't participate in the FBI data collection at all, really want to target these jurisdictions moving forward. So you can see these jurisdictions here on the slide. These are jurisdictions that didn't participate in FBI reporting last year, despite the fact that they have very high populations. So take a look at the slide. If you identify cities on this slide that you have connections to, you have ideas about how to improve reporting in these jurisdictions, you know, please read out, reach out to us. We'd love to be a thought partner in that regard. Um, here are cities with populations over 200,000, so very large cities that affirmatively reported zero hate crimes last year. Cities that have populations 100K, 200K, very unlikely that there are no hate crimes taking place in those jurisdictions. So these zero reporting jurisdictions are ones in which you know, we want to really give a careful look at the data, think about what's going on on the ground, make sure that these numbers are accurate. To take a look, here are all of the city's populations over 200,000. Here's the slide with um, zero reporting jurisdictions with populations over 100,000. I'll give folks a minute just to take a look at the slide, see if there are cities on here um, that you have connections to. Again, want to make sure that these cities are very carefully looking at um, hate crime data in their jurisdictions um, and doing their very best to report out hate crimes that are taking place on the ground. Next slide is the 10 largest cities in the US. So you see on here, New York, LA, Chicago, Houston. And you can see the trends that um, we've seen over the past two years when it comes to hate crime reporting. You'll see that hate crimes, um, actually the reported number of hate crimes increased in all of the cities but New York, Chicago, and San Diego. Um, again, important to take all of this data with a grain of salt. So just because numbers went up in a particular city does not necessarily mean the actual number of hate crimes on the ground increased. It could be members of a community are more comfortable coming forward. Or for example, law enforcement um, you know, has really ramped up efforts to identify and report out hate crimes. You know, we know that there was great work done on the ground, for example, in Philadelphia to ensure comprehensive um, reporting um, from Philly itself. So same can be said though about uh, jurisdictions where numbers went down, doesn't necessarily mean that hate crimes on the ground are actually going down. It could be, for example, that community members aren't comfortable coming forward to report those crimes, crimes aren't getting reported up to the FBI. So again, important data to keep in mind, but always important to consider context and other causal factors. Here are the remaining um, 40, top 40 cities. We just did the top 10. So the, the total of the past two slides is the top 50 cities on the US. We'll give folks a minute to see if you can identify you know, cities that you're connected to on this slide. The cities in red are ones in which either the increase or decrease was really, uh, really stood out to ADL relative to trends that we've seen over the years. So for example, in Boston, the 44 hate crimes reported last year was a number that was much lower than the number of hate crimes that's typically reported um, out of Boston. This slide is a little dense, so bear with me, and we can absolutely get these slides to you after the presentation, but this is a state-by-state -state comparison of hate crime data um, from 2020 going back to 2016. The yellow states show states where the increase in reported hate crimes was notable to ADL relative to trends that we've seen in that city over the years. Blue are decreases in reported hate crimes, but really noteworthy relative to trends that we've seen over the years. Um, next slide shows the number of law enforcement agencies that participated in FBI reporting. So you'll see here that um, Pennsylvania, we saw a really marked decrease in the number 
of participating agencies in 2020. So you can see that the number went down from about 1,400 participating agencies to 734 participating agencies in 2020. Um, green states here show states where there was a positive trend in the number of participating agencies in data collection. Red states show uh, states where there was a trend um, showing a decrease in the number of participating agencies when it comes to um, FBI reporting. So want to um, give careful consideration to, to ways to support the red states. Also want to applaud um, efforts that are underway in some of the green states to um, ensure that as many jurisdictions as possible are reporting data up to the FBI. So I want to take just a moment to highlight best practices when it comes to hate crime response. So from ADL's perspective, we generally prioritize as our you know, rubric for best response, anti-bias education in K through 12 schools, the passage of comprehensive and inclusive hate crime laws, the prioritization of data collection, which you know, runs uh, hand in hand with the numbers that we're seeing in 2020. And then finally, prioritizing a community-centered approach to hate crime response. Really wanna focus on the latter two categories for the remainder of the time that we have here, and then happy to answer any and all questions um, about ADL's approach when we have uh, time for Q&A. So first, why is hate crime um, data reporting important? So, you know, as has been referenced throughout this seminar, when one individual is targeted by a hate crime, it doesn't just impact that person, it impacts the entire community. Essentially, anyone who shares that protected characteristic is going to believe, you know, that they are not welcome. The message of the hate crime offender will ring loud and clear. That person will also be deeply impacted because they will feel like there's really nothing that they can do moving forward to prevent a similar crime from taking place uh, directed at their identity because when we talk about people being targeted for protected characteristics, we're being targeted for something about themselves that they can't change. It's immutable to who they are. We also know that data drives policy. So without having a complete and comprehensive picture of the problem, we can't begin to resolve root causes of surges in hate violence. Um, one of the most important justifications for reporting, though, is that when we have mechanisms set up to collect and report hate crime data, it actually sends a message to members of the community that law enforcement is there available and ready to respond when hate crimes take place, which actually can increase the likelihood that members of marginalized communities will come forward to report hate crimes in the first instance. And then finally, when it comes to reporting, ADL is intensifying advocacy to secure additional funding to improve record keeping on hate crimes and expand anti-hate education and victim services programming. That's advocacy that we're doing at the state and federal level legislatively, and also calling on legis for the passage of legislation that would require the collection and reporting of hate crimes, not only at the federal level, but at the state level as well. So, you know, thinking about reporting, important to remember some of the reasons why um, victims might not report and why law enforcement departments not, may not report. So when it comes to victims, there are also, there are always, um, you know, some barriers in place that we have to keep in mind. So one barrier is barriers due to anti-immigrant laws and policies. So fear within members of immigrant communities that if they come forward to report crime to law enforcement, there could be immigration related ramifications. There are also concerns, particularly now regarding the criminal legal system overall, and fears and concerns regarding law enforcement in particular. Um, many members of marginalized communities may fear retaliation. They may not believe that a hate crime is particularly serious. They may not be aware that something is a hate crime. Um, there could be language barriers that prevent individuals com from coming forward. Sometimes there is shame or embarrassment about what happened, particularly if someone is targeted for a protected characteristic that they have not yet revealed to the world. Um, and there's, of course, a shift towards alternatives um, to criminal legal remedies and alternatives to incarceration that may prevent individuals from coming forward. So individuals who would, you know, are not looking for a law enforcement response, for example, in connection with a hate motivated event. Um, According to recent data, there were approximately 54% of all hate crimes not reported to police. This is between 2011 and 2015. 
survey went out, individuals are asked, do you believe that you've ever been the victim of a hate crime? If so, did, it, did you report it to law enforcement? It's 54% of individuals who believed that they were a victim of a hate crime did not report to law enforcement. Here are some of the barriers um, that law enforcement departments face when it comes to reporting hate crimes. So it could be lack of resources or funding. There could be no data collection requirements in those jurisdictions or insufficient requirements. Um, perhaps the hate crime statutes aren't comprehensive and inclusive. So you know, many states, as I mentioned, don't have hate crime laws that provide protections for individuals who are targeted based on sexual orientation bias or gender identity bias. And so it's possible that in those jurisdictions, law enforcement haven't been trained to recognize those types of hate crimes for what they are. Um, it could be other departmental priorities or concerns that are taking resources away from hate crime reporting. And of course, lack of training regarding how to identify or respond to hate crimes. As I mentioned before, 2020 was the third straight year in which we saw the number of law enforcement agencies participating in the uh, hate crime statistics act data collection decline. So we really wanna work next year to get those numbers back up. Um, when it comes to data collection at the state and local level, though, really want to highlight a few interesting trends that ADL is seeing. So in Oregon, we recently saw the passage of a really comprehensive um, hate crime law that included data collection as a really important component. It also requires the creation of a victim-centered victim response hotline for reporting bias crimes. But one of the things that was really unique about this bill is that re it requires hate crime data reporting not only by law enforcement, but also by district attorneys. And we saw last year that Oregon as a state reported 60% more hate crimes in 2020. There were 280 reported relative to the 175 reported in 2019. This was also the highest number recorded in more than 20 years in Oregon. So really, really significant data coming in the aftermath of this new law. There's also a bill that I believe is now on the governor's desk in New York that would require statewide, I think it's something that NYPD is already doing, but statewide data collection, not only with respect to the protected identity of the victim targeted, but also with respect to the protected characteristic of the individual perpetrator. The idea is that we, when we understand how the laws are operating and being enforced in a particular jurisdiction, that data in and of itself will make members of communities more comfortable coming forward to report crime in the first instance. So this data collection bill is being seen as something just as important as the Oregon bill in ensuring that individuals are coming forward to report crime in the first instance. Very similar initiatives are underway in Massachusetts and Minnesota and in many other states across the country. Final trend that I want to highlight is community-centered approaches to hate crimes. So I'm sure that many on this call are now familiar with the term restorative justice, um, just certainly used in many other contexts. But there's been a real push in recent years to consider using restorative justice approaches in the context of hate crimes. Um, in, and in particular, when it comes to um, offenders who are minors. So the idea is that restorative justice takes on a victim-centered approach to justice, and sometimes it's used in parallel with traditional forms of um, you know, incarceration or criminal sentences, and sometimes it's used as a standalone process in the wake of a hate crime. But the idea is that the victim will be able to have a role and a say in what will help make that victim and help make that community whole. So we're seeing this process being used more and more in jurisdictions like New York. The first quote is actually a quote from District Attorney Vance explaining how um, even in the homicide case, restorative justice was really meaningful. The first sentence, for example, Traditional criminal prosecutions offer few opportunities to amplify victims' voices or allow for engagements between survivors and the accused. Today's sentencing proves that even in homicide cases, restorative justice is a meaningful way to empower survivors. We think that this is a really unique opportunity too in the hate crimes context to put the protected characteristic front and center in any form of um, you know, justice that is determined in connection with restorative justice. So of course, when someone is targeting another it's simply for who they are, there's a bias motivation there that has to be addressed in addition to the criminal offense that took place. And so restorative justice, education that can take place through restorative justice is one way 
to really get at that bias motivation that the perpetrator may harbor and try to rebuild um, a community in the wake of, of such incidents. So I want to end there um, and leave plenty of time for Q&A. So I will turn it back over to Elise. Thank you, Amy, for your presentation and all the work that you and the team are doing to prevent and respond to bias-motivated crimes. Um, we now have some time for questions. Again, you may send them to us using the chat function in Zoom, and we're going to do our best to address as many questions as we can in the time we have remaining, um, and to also um, to aggregate similar questions and, um, and, and, and lead with those. Um, the ones that keep that are coming up over and over again. Um, Officer Bert Grant is still with us for a few minutes. If you want to turn your camera on um, until you need to leave, I have we have some a few questions for you if you're willing to join the conversation. <clears throat> Officer Bert Grant, I'm here, but it's telling me I can't start my video because the host has stopped it. Oh, <laughs> here, let's try this. There we go. Your beautiful face is back. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to start, especially since you have to go teach in a few minutes. Yeah, I'm going to. Okay. I'm going to start. I was trying reading. to answer most of them in the chat, but I, I don't mind repeating myself or answering any new questions. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit about how um, what how the hate crime against your father affected the members of your family, um, and um, how those effects continue to impact the family years later? Okay, well, um, as of June seventh of this year, it's been twenty three years, and just like I stated to someone in the chat, it seemed like it was just yesterday. Um, some days are better than others, obviously, but. Um, we, we are a very close-knit family from my, th my two siblings and my dad's sisters, um, and he, I have an um, uncle as well. So we, we've always been raised to be a very close-knit family, and we've just gotten through it, just supporting each other um, and having faith in God through this whole 23 years of our life's change um, experience. So that's pretty much, it's a, it's a daily cope. I would tell anybody, um, you know, I don't know if I would, I forgive, but I'll never forget. And so some days are actually better than others, but I have to look at um, the fact that my dad will want us to do good with his name and also do good by promoting peace and love. And so that's what I vow to do. Beautiful. Um, what do you, I mean, you, you're Speaking now to about 400 law enforcement across the country, what do you want law enforcement to know about the importance of recogn properly recognizing and identifying hate crimes? Why is that so important? It's very important. Um, and I'll go back to when I was a rookie officer and I reported to a call um, and it was um, a hate crime call against um, a guy due to his gender preference. And the officer that checked by with me had no idea about um, the hate crime, hate crime bill prior, even the enhancement from my dad's um, bill had no idea. And so I, um, I tell every officer, I always give them out to my fellow co-workers as well. Familiarize yourself with the hate crime laws because it's not just um, against race. We have all kinds of discriminatory acts against um, gender and ethnicity, you know, just anything. And so I tell any officer, just familiarize yourself with the hate crime bill and the enhancements of it because it does happen. And a lot of people don't want to report it because of embarrassment or just lack of knowledge. And so we are on the front lines and we have to be the voice for those individuals. Thank you. Um, your family steadfastly supported law enforcement and the justice system after your father was murdered. What do you think made your family have so much faith in law enforcement uh, and how did that influence you to become a, a law enforcement officer? The uh, quick response that we had, um, it happened on an early Sunday morning, um, around one, between one and three o'clock in the morning, um, on that Sunday morning, 
And when I got to Jasper, I grew up in Lufkin, Texas. And so when we got the phone call from my aunt that we needed to head back to Jasper um, because we had just left on Saturday from a family function, it was law enforcement everywhere. So I would say the, the, the quick response that we got from local agencies as well as the FBI and just the love and support that we got throughout, um, just not that day, they continue to uh, check on our, my family. My grandparents was um, in their late 70s and just the, the justice system on finding justice for my family and everyone else that was involved in Jasper. Thank you, thank you. Um, so important to hear. Okay, um, Amy, a question for you. Um, there was some sort of questions about the cities that we showed reporting zero hate crimes. Um, somebody asked, isn't it possible that they just didn't have any? So can you elaborate a little bit more on why we're, um, why we've, well, you know, why it is that, that sometimes these, seeing these cities raise alarms, seeing the reporting? Yep. Absolutely. So the answer to that question is yes, absolutely. It's certainly possible that cities with populations over 100,000 did not have any hate crimes last year or in any given year. The point that we um, were trying to make is that when a jurisdiction has a population of 100,000 or more, it's a really significant number such that in, in most cases, it is unlikely that given the size of that population, no hate crimes took place. So while certainly possible, it's certainly possible for jurisdictions with populations hovering around 1,000, 100,000, 150,000 to have no hate crimes, we really want to make sure that those jurisdictions are taking a close look at the data to make sure that those zero numbers are accurate. When you start to think about, you know, jurisdictions with populations 200,000 and above, you know, again, very unlikely that on the ground, zero hate crimes are actually taking place. It could be that in those jurisdictions, members of the of communities that are being targeted aren't coming forward to report hate crimes to law enforcement. That's why law enforcement is reporting a zero number up to the FBI. We just want to make sure that those jurisdictions are really taking a close look at the protocols and procedures that they have in place in their departments to make sure they're doing everything possible to remove barriers that might prevent victims from coming forward, and then making sure that all of the training mechanisms are in place so that those departments can identify hate crimes if and when they are reported. Thank you. And can you talk a little bit more about the concerns about um, the agencies that do not report at all? Like, why yeah. is that concerning us? Right. So, so those agencies are agencies with high populations that aren't participating at all. So they're not coming and saying to the FBI, there were zero hate crimes in our jurisdiction. They're actually jurisdictions that aren't repeal appearing in the FBI hate crime statistics data collection at all. So we want to make sure that we know what's going on in those jurisdictions, those jurisdictions, again, that have pretty high populations, you know, highly unlikely that there are zero hate crimes actually taking place in those jurisdictions, want to make sure that they're participating. One of the main reasons, though, that we want those jurisdictions to participate is because we want members of the community to have faith and confidence that that law enforcement department is equipped to identify and respond to hate crimes. So if members of a community don't see their jurisdiction actually collecting and reporting data to the FBI, they may believe that that jurisdiction simply isn't available to them equipped to identify and respond to hate crimes. That's also why participation, even if the number is zero, participation and affirmatively telling the FBI we did not collect any hate crime data last year, we saw zero hate crimes, is in and of itself extremely important. Thank you. Um, I'm seeing some requests for the slides and copies of the of the recording. Um, if you reach out to Casey, my colleague Casey Quinn at cquinn at abl.org, um, we can have a copy of either the recording or the slides themselves or both. Um, to you, so feel free to reach out. Um, there's questions. Um, how much influence do you think uh, sort of the politics play, or if you will, or um, PR of you know cities not wanting to look like they're unsafe um, or bad places to live because they have high hate crimes, and and that sort of being a deterrent to 
to um, reporting high numbers. To what extent do you think that comes into play? Um, and what is our response to that? I think it's really hard to say. You know, I think we have every confidence that law enforcement is doing their due diligence to collect and report data that comes into them. There are, of course, real sensitivities, though, when you see market increases in a particular jurisdiction. You know, you can there can be media stories, news stories that start to indicate that this is an unsafe jurisdiction, and that's something that we certainly have to grapple with. The message that ADL tries to convey, you know, is is really nuanced when it comes to that type of data. So what we will say is you can't automatically assume that just because a number went up in a given year that actual hate crimes on the ground actually increased. Again, it could be better reporting from communities, better reporting from law enforcement, more training of law enforcement, more awareness um, within you know, specific communities, more national attention on a particular type of hate crime, right? So we saw this real, you know, boom in national attention when it comes to anti-AAPI hate this year. We also saw, you know, a real increase in the number of reported anti-AAPI hate crimes across the country. So all of that context is incredibly important. And that's something that jurisdictions should know, that when your numbers go up, we and many others will support you because we know that that means that you're doing your job. So we will support you in, collect, in connection with that reporting and then in connection with any and all efforts that are underway to help address you know, what may be rises in hate crimes in your jurisdiction. Thank you, Amy. Um, let's see. Uh, again, oh, I you, did see a yes, question. Um, someone asked, um, it was like two questions. Have I had contact with any, with uh, one of them, any of the murders or any, um, I think it was just any of the family members too. I don't know if that, but any of the murders, I think is what it said. No, I have not. Um, I had no desire to speak with any of them. And, um, and it was reciprocated. It was likewise, they, they didn't want to speak with me or any of my family members as well. Um, and they actually stated two that was getting executed that they um, did not regret their actions. So, mm -hmm. but I did speak with one of the individual's brother um, some years back, and he was very apologetic um, on behalf of his family for the acts of his, uh, what his brother did to my family. Mm. my dad. Mm. Thank you, Officer Burt Grant. Um, let me see. Again, if you have any uh, questions that you'd like to ask, feel free to um, write them in the chat. I'm just trying to um, catch up on some of them. I see one here and I'm reading ahead because I do have to leave, but I want to make sure that I answer everyone's questions. Um, as a black female, are you facing racial discrimination within your department? And I would say, no, I've been on 10 and a half years. And with the Houston Police Department, we um, we have very strict policies and we're, we've trained um, very well. We, we take uh, annual courses and I tell people it's not in a training that they provide for us. You have to come in with that in your heart, with, with any kind of biases or prejudices in your heart. And I can say um, through our recruitment process, we have done a really good job here at the Houston Police Department with winking out those individuals who um, may be on the left side of things and not um, joining the police department for the right reasons. So no, I have not um, in my 10 and a half years on the department, um, had any racial discrimination. No. It's good to hear that that hasn't been your experience. Um, uh, I hope before you leave, you get a chance to see all the, um, the comments coming into the chat about how uh, meaningful it was to, to get to meet you, if you will, today um, through Thank this you. and to, to hear some of your story. Thank you. Um, we are just a few minutes um, shy of the hour, so uh, I think we can um, uh, try to, to wrap up shortly. Um, uh, any final words from either of you? Final words or comments that you'd like to share? No, I would just like to say um, thank you. Thank you, ADL, for this opportunity and this platform. I'm, I'm proud to serve on the board of ADL. And I'm just here, um, like I, I say, 
always, I'm here to be the change that I want to see. I want to be the change agent um, in the police force and also just in the community as well. You know, I tell people all the time, it's, it's really um, looked down upon being a police officer. Um, then on top of that, being a black female police officer and to, to wear all those hats and stand for greatness. You know, I, I just think um, it's an honor to, to be able to wear this badge and be a part of this type of organization. And as long as I'm here, I will do everything that I can and in my power to, um, to promote peace and love and justice for all. Thank you, Officer Bird. It's such an honor to, to meet you and spend some time with you. We, we really appreciate Thank you sharing you. your story with us. Okay. Amy, any final words that you'd like to, to leave? You know, just stay in touch. Um, you know, the three of us on the on the line right now would love to continue to be a resource to this community. You know, as we said, data drives policy. We now have the 2020 figures at our fingertips. Um, we know that there's important work ahead of us. And so please, um, you know, use us as a resource. We will circulate the slides and really looking forward to keeping in touch and thinking about creative ways that we can tackle these problems at a state and local. Oh, before we end, I just want to again express our deepest appreciation to Officer Bird Grant for joining us today to share her personal story, for her advocacy on this issue, and her service to the community. Um, I'd like to also thank my colleague Amy again for her informative presentation and leadership in addressing bias motivated crime. At the conclusion of the session, you're going to see a link pop up for a survey about today's webinar. We'd greatly appreciate it if you would take a minute or two to provide some feedback. We want to thank you all for taking the time to join us today. Again, continue to be in touch as we can help you and your departments um, support you um, in your work to combat hate-motivated hate crime. And uh, we hope everybody stays health healthy and safe and in touch. Thanks.